You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 143 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show, and today my guest is Dave Cusack. Dave is the founder and former CEO of Berkeley Music, the world's largest music school, where he's helped teach tens of thousands of students around the world and created hundreds of online music courses. He also co-wrote the book, The Future of Music, which has sold over 50,000 copies in that book. The future of iPhone, Siri, and Spotify were all predicted. And uh, Dave's newest venture is New Artist Model, where he hopes to continue to educate artists and send them on a path of turning their music career into a business. Let's get to my interview with Dave. Well, joining me is Dave Cusack, the founder of New Artist Model. Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. It's I, I can't remember when the last time was you were on the podcast. It's been some time, and uh, so it's great to have you back. Well, I appreciate it, and it, you know, it's really good to see how how the whole thing has grown, and you know how you've been at it and interviewed you know a lot of really great people. So, congratulations to you. Well, well, thank you. And I don't know if I told you this the last time, but it was. I think it was right around the time I started working at CD Baby. I had your audio book, Future of the Music Business, and I was listening to it every day as I was go- going snowboarding. And so uh, it's it's uh, interesting to still be conversing with you and after uh, and see how the industry has progressed because that was back in like 2005, 2006 when uh, that book was out and, and um, every day I go into the mountain for like, uh, a couple weeks, I was listening to that and and uh, sitting there having thoughts about where things were headed, and and now I'm at CD Baby and talking to you still. So that's that's very cool. Well, it, it's great. You know, we had a lot of fun, uh, not only writing that book, but that led to a lot of conversations with you know different people and companies around the industry, and you know we were very grateful to be able to. Uh, you know, help guide some people and answer some questions for folks. And, you know, not everything turned out uh, exactly as we predicted, but quite a few things did. So, you know, I I feel lucky to be uh, to be part of the industry and to, you know, to still be uh, able to contribute and help people, which is really what I'm focused on now is trying to work with independent artists and songwriters and producers and some uh, small uh, you know, music businesses to get started and, and to, uh, you know, to grow uh, your business as a musical entrepreneur, depending on how you define that. Yeah. So why don't you catch us up to speed with what you've been doing? Uh, I think the last time we talked, you were uh, running the Berkeley Online School. And um, so why don't you catch us up to speed with what you've been doing since then? Sure. Um I'll, you know, for the, for the sake of your audience, I'll just give you the, the very, very quick bio. I've been involved in music and technology my whole career. I started a s- synthesizer company called Synair uh, quite a while ago. We made electronic drums. I started a music software company called Passport. Uh, we made sequencers and music notation transcribers, some audio editors. I was lucky enough to be involved in creating the MIDI standard with a bunch of friends of mine uh, quite a while ago. And, you know, we we created MIDI interfaces and software. Uh, Then I uh, went from Passport and uh, got involved with Berklee College of Music. And at that time, it was pretty clear that the industry was going online. The Internet was going to transform everything. So we created an online school. Uh, which is now called Berkeley Online, which has become the the largest music school on the planet, uh, and we were able to figure out how to how to teach music online and how to teach uh, you know business production songwriting theory harmony ear training uh, all of that. So I had a you know great great uh, time at Berkeley working with all the great people there and you know building that business up and. 
a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted a break and, you know, I took some time off and, but I also thought that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start over with an online school using the, uh, the very, very modern technologies that we have available to us to deliver high quality instruction. But I also wanted to, you know, address uh, a market that I saw uh, people that, uh, you know, were interested in pursuing a career in music, but didn't necessarily have tens of thousands of dollars to spend on a music education at Full Sail or Berkeley or, you know, NYU or Musicians Institute, any, anywhere, you know, where people would traditionally go. Uh, but I, I thought, well, why not create an online school that was very much on the ground, on the street, uh, aligned with everything that's happening in the industry, all the software, all the online services, all the tools that we have, the distribution methods that we have, and to be able to teach uh, people while they're working, you know, while they're in the studio, while they're on the road, while they're, you know, writing songs, whatever it is that they're up to, to be able to uh, help them run their businesses effectively in real time and take themselves to the next level. So that's the new artist model online school that uh, has now been up and running about eight or nine months. And, you know, we're in our third season and things are going really, really well. Well, excellent. Yeah, there's there's a lot of options out there for uh, education and some of them can be uh, quite spendy. I know the college I went to <laughs> back in the 90s has priced me out these days. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, when you look at the reality of the music biz- business, as you well know, um, you know, to to go to school for four years and come out with a hundred grand in debt uh, if your parents aren't rich and then to uh, to try and make a living in music and carry that kind of debt and, and be able to pay it off is uh, that's a lot to ask of someone. And you know, I, I think that there's a better way that you can you can learn more practical uh, stuff that you can immediately put to use that you don't have to spend tens of thousands or more on and, you know, not have to carry a, a big debt and recoup the money that you spend on your education very, very quickly by putting the, the tools and process that we teach in place right away. And so that's that's what we're really trying to do right now is address the reality of the business. It's a tough business, as you know, and all, all your listeners know. Um, so how do, we, how do we move forward from here is the question. So if an artist is interested in some education, what, what can they expect from new artist model? I mean, how do the classes work? Uh, what, you said you're starting a new uh, term. How, how all does that work? And what, what's, what's available to them? Sure. So we have uh, we have one main program that that we offer called our essential class, and it's an eight module class. You could take it in eight weeks. Uh, that's about the right pace. You could do it shorter. You could do it longer. Uh, but you go through that material on your own, and it's it it's laid out so that you you do some planning up front, some self exploration. What are you up to? What are your goals and dreams? Uh, What are you good at? And then from that work, we move into looking at what what is your team? Do you have a team? Uh, And how is that working? Are are you aligned right? Uh, Is your team on on board with you? Or if you have no team, what might your team look like? And we balance that between what are you good at and what do you like to do versus what do you need to get done. And that often tells you the kind of team that you might need. And it might just be one other person. Uh, And then from there, we look at recording uh, and distribution strategies. We look at songwriting and publishing and licensing strategies. We look at touring and gigging uh, and sponsorship strategies. So we go through that depending on, you know, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we, we really lay out uh, effectively a business plan for you where you can go and turn on multiple revenue streams 
depending on, you know, are you more of a performing artist? And so that'll lead you down one path. Are you more of a songwriter? That'll lead you on another path. Are you some combo? Uh, so we look at that and then we create a marketing plan to help you execute on those strategies and start generating revenue or, or increase the revenue you're already generating, uh, whether it's, you know, merch or, or tickets or touring or selling recordings or licensing your music or sponsorships uh, or, you know, other ancillary revenue streams that you might want to turn on, <clears throat> depending on, you know, what you're all about and what you want to do. And then we also look at uh, crowdfunding and other ways of uh, organizing your finances and your budget. So we, we come out of that process with uh, a very solid plan for you as a creative artist to execute on with strategies to move your career forward, with uh, an organizational structure uh, for you to you know, build a team and, and build your business uh, a way often to raise uh, money and get a crowdfunding campaign, or you know, it could be Patreon, it could be Kickstarter, it could be Pledge, uh, it could be Indiegogo, or other. You know, if you're outside the U.S., there are other options. And then, you know, that's the essential class. Uh, we also offer a master class, which is all of that, but you get coaching from uh, myself and Rick Barker, who's my partner in uh, in this uh, venture. Rick is the uh, former manager to Taylor Swift, and he's the guy that really started as her manager uh, and helped her get going and has a lot of you know, very practical, on-the-ground ways of developing your fan relationships, developing your social presence, uh, being very effective on the road, uh, doing radio tours and, and, and all of that. So a master class gives you access to Rick and I for eight weeks. We do eight uh, coaching calls where we work with you to try and uh, move your career forward. And then we also have an elite class that is a, is a one-year program where we work uh, with you uh, every week for a year to you know execute on, on your plan. So we do the planning part and then we help you execute. So those are the three flavors uh, of what we're currently offering. We have a couple other, uh, we have one class on social uh, media marketing for musicians that we're gonna roll out in the next couple of weeks, but that, that's effectively what we're offering at the moment. So how long does that uh, class last? It sounds like it's quite a bit of stuff that's covered. Is that for the whole year? Is that for a quarter or how long does it last? Well, you get access to the class for a whole year. Uh, some people do it very quickly because, you know, they're impatient and they want to get going. And some people are so busy that, you know, they, they take a little bit at a time. Uh, a lot of people start very quickly and then go out and execute for a while and then come back into the program to fine tune their plan. <clears throat> but you have a year's access to everything. And uh, depending on which, you know, flavor of the of the program you go with, you, you'll get coaching from Rick and I as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, I'm assuming that you're getting artists from all walks of life and different genres and different ideas of what success looks like for them. Are there any consistent themes that you're hearing from any artists, things that they're trying to figure out or, or just, uh, you know, they're coming to you with some similar issues that they're trying to solve? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a long answer, so I'll try and break it up. And maybe, oh, we've maybe, got time, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me some questions along the way. Um, yeah, we have people from all over the world taking uh, our classes, which is great. And that we do a lot of things in groups because it's, uh, it's an opportunity for people to learn from one another. Uh, so one thing that comes up quite a bit is, you know, when you're in your own region, you know, wherever it is that you live, uh, you have a perspective that is very much based on, you know, the reality of your market. And I can tell you that different markets around the world are, are uh, 
behaving differently. Some people are having, uh, you know, different kinds of success depending on sort of what the what the customer base is like in that market. So that's a that's a common thing that people tend to think that you know they're the experience that they've had is is all there is, and and what we try and open up is sort of the world of music because you know in a lot of territories, I mean, cassettes are still big in India, right? And that market is so different than you know what you'd find in Brazil or what you would find in uh, Japan or what you would find in California uh, or what you'd find in the Midwest. So oftentimes you know, working with other people, you get to see things from a different perspective. So that, that's one uh, thing that happens a lot. Um, people have uh, challenges in managing their time and figuring out what to work on next, like what will move the needle for you. Uh, everybody's got that problem. And so we try and, you know, meet people where they are in their career you could be, you know, really just starting out, starting to write some tunes. And, you know, we have a bunch of uh, parent-kid uh, combinations in the school where the parent is, you know, trying to support their son or daughter and get them going in their career. And, you know, they could be in high school in some cases, just starting out. Uh, or we have people that are, you know, two, three years into it and <clears throat> feel like they've hit the wall and, and want to want to break through, but everybody is sort of consumed with how do I do all this stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I be a creative person on one hand and how do I be a business person on the other hand? And, you know, you could get sucked into the social media world uh, so quickly that you spend all of your time there and you never, you know, perform or write or record. So there's a, there's a lot of time management and balancing uh, techniques that we teach. Uh, because everyone seems to have that issue. <clears throat> yeah, that that is definitely an issue for artists. That uh, there's a lot of tools online, a lot of things you can do, and uh, it's not it's not too far down the road. You realize, hey, I didn't, uh, I haven't made any music this last year, or last month, or last couple of months. And if I want to be a professional musician, that might be a key piece. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, oftentimes we'll tell people that you need to segment your week or your month. And, you know, we get a calendar out and we'll work with you and say, all right, what, what, if you need to write music, so block off two days a week to do that, or, you know, a week, a month to do that, depending on what your, what your schedule is like. You know, a lot of people are full-time at it as a, as a musician. So they have, you know, a lot of flexibility in their time. And some people have a you know, a day gig and they're doing music on the side, trying to quit that day gig. And so they have a lot more time constraints. So depending on where you are, we'll help you organize a schedule where you can decide what it is, what is it that I need to do in the next six months or 12 months? And how do I partition my time to be able to do that? And who can I get to help me uh, kind of execute my vision and my my dream and how do I compensate those people? Uh, because oftentimes, you know, another common problem, nobody has any money. So how do you get somebody to join your team when you can't pay them? Uh, and we look at, you know, different strategies about inspiring and motivating people, uh, getting them to buy in on your dream, uh, figuring out how to leverage your bandmates, for example, to be, to be, uh, more than, uh, to be all that they can be, Kevin, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so you mentioned, you know, people struggling with different markets and not realizing that things are different in other places. And we've definitely seen that at CD Baby. We've been broadening into some international markets. And it's amazing how different the industry is in, in different places, especially like you mentioned, Brazil compared to Japan, compared to the U.S., the artists are in a very different place. The music business is not identical. And a lot of times we tend to look at everything and assume that what's happening here is the same happening around the world. But it's definitely different. Um, 
as as you've seen artists come through your your program, have you seen them sort of transform in certain ways, going from figuring some of these things out and and uh, and seeing new success? And and if so, if it, how what are some of those transformations, or or maybe just aha moments that the person's had and how they've used those things to kind of put their career on the right path sure <clears throat> there there's been uh there's been a lot of transformation and, and a lot of aha moments uh you know for example letting people know uh how to how to uh, leverage their fan base and how to you know, make their fans their friends and get their fans involved in their marketing uh, and in, you know, applying social media in an, in an effective <laughs> way where you can, uh, you know, you can quickly grow your following, which is important on one hand, but you want the right following and you, you want to try and attract people that, you know, are, are, you know, the, the, the cliche, the true fan, the thousand true fans. Uh, if you can, if you can attract people that are really into your music and empower them, whether it's a street team or a virtual street team or having them, uh, you know, help you, uh, when you're on the road, uh, bring their friends to shows, spread the word through their social networks, Lots of people get that aha moment when they realize that they're not alone. You know, you feel like sometimes you're alone with your keyboard and your computer and you're trying to move things forward. Well, you can, you can build a little army of people to help you. And that's one of the things that we've seen uh, people really light up about when they realize that, uh, you know, they're, they're they're not alone, and there are ways to to get your fans to help you grow your business. Uh, so that's that's been a, a transformational thing that a lot of people have seen. Turning people on to uh, uh, the realities of crowdfunding has also been interesting because uh, you know, as as much as you and I are in the industry and we're you know we live and breathe it every day, and you know we're aware of all these great resources. Lots of people are not aware of them. And more importantly, if they are aware, they're not that clear on how to execute a campaign so that it will be effective for them and, you know, how to aim their sites right and how to, you know, bring a crowd to the campaign. And, and the fact that, you know, there are different options. Uh, as you know, I know you're running a pledge campaign and I love those guys. Um, and, and that's a, you know, that's a platform for your career, really. I mean, because you can, you can develop your career over time with Pledge. It's not just a project like it is on Kickstarter. And so knowing the difference between, you know, maybe a, something that you can use over and over again, like Pledge Music, versus Kickstarter tends to be, you know, a project starts and ends and that's it. And then you've got to, you know, resubmit and do another project. Knowing that, uh, you know, you have these different tools that you could uh, bring uh, in, into your fold, depending on what you're trying to do. And then there's Patreon, which is a completely different model, where you can, uh, you can basically uh, encourage your fans to pay you as you release songs, for example, or as you release videos, or as you release some other creative work, could be a lesson. Uh, and that way you get paid, you know, on a more regular basis. And again, Patreon can, can be used for your whole career. It's not just for music, of course. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, film people on there, and graphic artists, and uh, comics, and bloggers on there. But just knowing that there are ways of uh, tapping into your fan base to raise money, to move your career forward. That's an aha moment for a lot of people. So you, you mentioned uh, Patreon, which uh, is 
I have not used that service yet, but it seems like for a certain artist, it's it's working quite well. Uh, do you think? What do you think about the idea of selling music and and what artists need to do to make a living with with services like how people are using Pledge, but specifically like Patreon? Uh, you know, Jack Conte, we've had on the podcast a couple times, and he's a very energetic guy and fun to talk with. And he's he's kind of convinced that people won't buy music anymore and uh, that this is how the, 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 the model that has to exist for artists. Um, but uh, since you deal with a lot of different artists and different walks of life and different uh, genres and career paths, it'd kind of be interesting to get, get your take on that idea of the viability of still selling music. I know this is a, it's a growing frustration with artists in a Spotify world that there's less and less money out there for them. Yeah, I, you know, I think that that's the big elephant in the room at the moment. And I wish I had a silver bullet answer for you. Um, I have seen people that have been successful selling recordings, either singles or downloads or CDs. Um, we've seen people that have had a lot of success doing that at shows. So CDs as a form of merch, if you will, um, has, has worked for a lot of people. And other uh, techniques that we've seen work are kind of doing two for two first this is back to getting your fans to work for you sell two cds for the price of one and encourage that person who buys it uh to give one away to their friends and if you do that say at the merch booth at the venue you can sign that cd you can you know bring that person into your virtual team if you will, to create a relationship with them, make them your friend, and then encourage them. You know, maybe they've given you 10 bucks or 20 bucks, whatever you charge them. Encourage them to go and spread the word. And, you know, other people have bundled tickets with, uh, with music as a way of increasing the value of the purchase. Uh, so, I mean, those are, those are some, uh, techniques that are working for people. And again, I think it depends on, on what market you're in. Uh, you know, we, we're pretty spoiled here in the U S we have, you know, ridiculous broadband and, and streaming is a, you know, a good reality for us as consumers it may not be a good reality for us as artists, but it's not like that in, in uh, many, many places in the world uh, where people can still sell records. I mean, there are lots of places in Europe that still have crappy broadband, if, if you can even call it broadband at all. And then, of course, you know, there's Sweden where, you know, Spotify is, is really doing very, very well. So, again, it's not, it's not the same. But I think if people think of uh, recorded music, if there's a takeaway that that I encourage people to walk away from this podcast from is, you know, merchandise is a great revenue stream if you play live. And if you have a reasonable to large audience, you can also, uh, you know, make money uh, online as well as at the venue. And if you think of uh, packaged recorded music as a form of merchandise uh, and, add value to that package and be creative on how you promote it and distribute it. Uh, you know, just like a t-shirt or a hat or a poster or, you know, a cup or any of the other crazy ideas that people are trying for merch can also uh, apply to recorded music. Uh, you know, where the whole thing goes, um, you know, the mus music business has always been driven by, format changes, and new music. And so I think that the, you know, we're, we're, at, a, we're at a point in the business now where it's, it's quite different than it was five or ten years ago. Uh, I don't see the new format immediately in front of us, but I know there's a new format coming. 
Uh, and therefore, you know, I'm optimistic that people that are writing new music and uh, connecting with audiences, uh, particularly young audiences, are going to become uh, more important as time goes on. And new format or formats will emerge that, you know, maybe we can't quite predict what they're going to be like. It might be an audio visual format. It might be a format that has some sort of sharing built into it, uh, but it will emerge. And I, I don't think that the, you know, the story is over about how do you make money in recorded music. I think it's just uh, in, in a big transition. Well, Bono said he, he's going to work with Apple to solve that problem. So <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know what they have in mind with uh, with a new format, but uh, they alluded to that with their their launch of their latest album that they're working on something to help artists make more money. Uh, the jury's still out on that one, though. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm optimistic though because people love music; they love to listen to it. It's it's an emotional experience. People love to make music. And if those two things are true, um, there's a lot of smart people working on these problems. And, and you know, we're going to have we're going to have a healthy music industry out into the future. I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. Well, I agree that there's always going to be the demand for music. People love music. They spend a good portion of their day listening to it. They would hate for it to all go away. So uh, I think it's just a matter of really connecting fans to to the the artists themselves, as opposed to seeing it as a transaction between them and a record store. And the more that they understand that the artists are real people that are making the real music, that uh, and if they want that to continue, they have to be able to feed and clothe themselves. Then uh, I think there eventually will be. Uh, the, the understanding and building a, a, a ecosystem that will work. Yeah. Well, you know, streaming too, it, you know, we wrote a, a lot about sort of the, the transformation from, uh, you know, recorded music and, you know, s the, the physical formats going into the cloud in the future of music book. And, you know, Daniel from Spotify bought the book, read it, and said, great idea, I'm going to start a company. I mean, he told us that. Uh, what didn't happen, two things have not happened in the streaming market that I think would make a huge difference. And whether they're possible to happen or not, you know, out into the future, I, I don't know. But I, again, I, I'm hopeful. But two things didn't happen in streaming. One is the the deals for artists didn't change with that format. Now, for example, if artists got half the money that the stream generated rather than, you know, a fraction of a penny or a fraction of a percent uh, of what the stream generated, the economics for artists on the streaming side would be way different. But the labels didn't let that happen. The publishers didn't let that happen, at least not at the moment. Uh, if half the money generated by streaming was flowing directly to the artists, we would have a different world. That's one thing. The second thing is the price of the streaming services are still too high. They've not uh, achieved a massive adoption rate yet, not even close to that, because the prices are too high. And when you run the math, and th you know this is an equation that we did in 2005, 2006, where if the price of the streaming service is low enough that it, it feels like it's free and you don't even think about it, then the adoption rate will, will increase uh, exponentially from where it is today. But because of the way the label deals are structured and the publisher deals are structured, the, the price of the service is still too high and the flow of money to the artist is still too low. And I think that makes a broken system. And if those two things could, could you know, come more into alignment, 
I think that that format, or perhaps what the streaming format evolves into, could be very lucrative for everybody. Yeah, I, I agree that it's definitely not a, uh, it's not where it needs to be yet. And I think there's there's some uh, good ideas out there of how it can work. I think the frustration from the independent music community is that they're often not at the table, even though the uh, independent music catalogs, including what we have at CD Baby and and uh, some other folks that have big uh, indie catalogs, that uh, we represent a lot of streams and a lot of sales and. Uh, and that the industry has to shift off of just thinking that the major labels own the whole market. And uh, so it, it, it's going to be interesting. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's people that want to make it work. So we'll see. Well, you know, maybe there's a chance for an indie streaming service to, you know, to emerge. Like I said earlier, the new music matters more than the catalog. I mean, yeah, it, it's probably, I mean, we've, it's something, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about here at CD Baby, but, uh, you know, we don't have any plans to do anything there at this time. You know, the one thing I've been thinking about lately is what, what's happening on the film side of entertainment and how Netflix and Amazon are almost like the new uh, movie studios and TV studios, Um generating a lot of original content and starting to think, well, maybe <laughs> wonder if the streaming companies will be the new record companies and they'll be funding the creation of music in order to keep their, their streaming service vibrant and, and different from the other options out there. Well, I mean that, I think that could certainly happen whether, you know, whether an Apple or a Spotify would want to get into that business uh, versus would somebody start, you know, a lot of, uh, what, what, uh, you know, I see in, uh, in the market of working with, with indie bands is if you make a really good song or a really good collection of songs, however you package that, uh, people will listen and that will spread quickly because you've made something that's just awesome, right? That's really great. And you can see that happening, you know, with these YouTube videos going viral. You create something that's really great and it will spread in and of itself. And so I still believe that, you know, the, the new music matters more than the old music. And if you create something that's like white hot, great, and get yourself into, into a position where you can leverage that property to make the right deal or to make the right partnership partnership or in you know the context of what we're talking about if enough people banded together that you know had uh, kind of what people wanted it it you know it, it's possible that a new uh, model could emerge that would be healthier for the for the industry and therefore you know, the, the new music could help to drive what happens in the future more so than the catalog. I really think the power is with the indie musician. Uh, it's just a matter of getting organized. Well, I agree with uh, the idea that, you know, it's if you have good music, it'll it'll connect with folks. And and that's why, you know, oftentimes I get frustrated with artists who are, you know, kind of wondering why nothing's happened for them yet. And I, and then, you know, just kind of talking about what they've done and, and they say, I've got two songs available. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you could have two amazing songs, but you need to keep writing and recording and, and constantly honing your craft and, and getting better. It's, it's a journey. It's not a, hey, uh, I did a drive by and ma- took a stab at it and nothing happened. So uh, I'm on to something else. So I mean, it, it's something art does take time to develop and the more you do it, the better you get. And, and just, you know, that maturity helps connect with other folks. Yeah, I, I agree. If you look at any of the great masters, you know, whether it's in music or, or painting or sculpture or, you know, any kind of visual art, you know, people like uh, Salvador Dali and Picasso, I mean, they painted thousands of things. And we might know about, you know, 
some people know about one or two or, you know, collectors might know about, uh, you know, dozens, but they've been extremely prolific. So, I mean, to your point, the more you can create, the better. And you never know, you know, when you wake up one morning, if today's going to be the day where you write that hit. Yeah. Yep. And it won't happen if you don't, if you spend all your time on social media. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, what, what can artists do to find out more about what you guys are doing at new artist model and find out about the classes and, and, uh, if you, if you have any final thoughts for us, that would be great. Uh, well, thank you. The, uh, the website is newartistmodel.com. Uh, we also have a video series that is at uh, newartistblueprint.com. So if you go to either one of those websites, uh, you'll see what we're up to. Uh, and parting thoughts, you know, I... It, it's almost a cliche, but I do really believe that this is a great time to be in, in the music business. It's a struggle, but you know what? It's always been a struggle. And the idea that, you know, all the bands that we know and love, uh, you know, have always been successful. It's just not true. It takes an incredible amount of hard work. It takes years, sometimes way more years than you want it to, to, uh, you know, develop your, your repertoire and develop your, your chops and your ability to entertain people. And so keep at it and, uh, keep your eyes open and network with folks and manage your time well, and don't give up because, uh, there are plenty of people that will appreciate the music that you make, uh, so long as you keep making it and you reach out to them and let them know about it. Agreed. Agreed. Well, well, Dave, thanks for, for being on the podcast and, uh, um, I'm sure we'll have you back sometime again in the future and, and uh, we'll be watching what you're doing over there at new artist model. Thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Uh, hope to be back again sometime. Thanks. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again to Dave Cusack for coming on the show and if you want to check out what he's doing you can check it out over at newartistmodel.com if you have any comments or thoughts about the show or just uh, want to weigh in on a topic you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com or you can call our listener line and that number is 360-524-2209 Just try to keep your phone messages brief. I think it cuts off after two minutes, but love playing phone calls on the show. And uh, and you can always leave comments on the episode show notes at cdbabypodcast.com. Well, that's going to do it for this time. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.